The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 701 for Monday, March 19th, 2018. Go readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix them all together. Oh, you know it. We make that salad. We throw in some extra croutons. We fill in with tasty dressing. The idea is it's good for you. It tastes good. It's happy. You're healthy. And each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include RoboForm. Or RoboForm.com, coupon code MGG saves you 10 bucks off your RoboForm Everywhere subscription. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And Jamf Now, Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG, gets you your first three devices free for life. They're great mobile device management system. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, back in Durham, New Hampshire, safely, thankfully, I might add, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, still in fearful Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Eh, hanging in there. Good. Good, good. Good, good. Just getting ready for the last, last hurrah. What's, what's the last hurrah? What are you talking about? Oh, we're getting another storm. Yeah, but it's not supposed here? to be as big as, as, as they said it was originally, right? I don't think. Yeah. And actually the others were pretty wimpy, at least for me. So. Oh, dude. They weren't wimpy here. We had 14 inches before I left and then 26 inches while I was gone in Texas. My family had to contend with. Yeah, we had like two. Oh, really? <laughs> really? No kidding. That last one last week. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Wow. That's crazy. All right. Well, you want to, uh, why don't you kick this one off since you weren't buried in snow this week? I mean, I, I wasn't buried in snow either. I was down in Austin. It was 88 degrees. Not in Austin. Yeah. No. It was beautiful. Anyways. Yeah. Gary writes and says, hey, Mackie Gab crew, do you know of an app or a way to set my computer to restart itself weekly? I try to follow the recommendation mentioned on several shows that it's a good idea to restart your Mac weekly. I try to make it a habit to do so every Sunday, but depending on how early I have to be in at work the day, sometimes it gets done later in the day or my next day or, you know. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice if I could have it done 1 a.m. on Sunday. Um, and then he mentioned something interesting. Uh, I use iMazing to do this weekly reboot of my iDevices, but I don't see anything in the system preferences on the Mac. Thank you, and don't get caught. Really? So, f first of all, um, I had no idea that iMazing could schedule a weekly reboot of my iOS devices. That's very interesting. Huh. I have seen that if you bring up the detail. Yeah, if you're running it, um, mm. I have seen that it can do a, a restart and a shutdown. I've um, seen that. I just didn't, I didn't realize know I could. could yeah. Huh. Huh. All right. Well, you know, there you go. I've got something to say hey. about that later, but I, I, I've derailed you enough. Sorry. Oh, good. No. Oh, no, no. So, um, and Gary, you got so close. Oh, he's so close because he mentions that, yes, you can schedule a sleep. And the magic answer here. There is an answer, is that it's in the exact same place, but it, it's not obvious. Um, so if you go into System Preferences, Energy Saver Schedule, dot, 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 means that there's going to be multiple things to confuse you in the next <laughs> dialogue. Um, you see two choices here, start or wake, and then sleep. But sleep is a, a, a pull-down menu, and if you click on it, it also has restart and shutdown. And then you can also choose the frequency and the time that that happens. So he could choose Sunday at 2 a.m. like he wants. And mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, <laughs> I've been thinking of doing something similar. The thing is actually my Mac Mini, which seems to like to wake up all the time. I actually schedule it to go to sleep at midnight every oh, day. Just to yeah. make it take yeah. hold. Because it, 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 sometimes I'll walk in the room and it's like awake and I'm like, why are you awake? Yeah, what are There's you doing? Happening. Awake? Yeah, my my <laughs> iMac in the office is the same way. Some sometimes, not 
all the time, certainly not even half the time, but yeah, sometimes it's just, I get in and it's like, how you doing? Like, wait, what? What, what have you been doing up all night? So, yeah. Huh. Interesting. 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 And then the next one we have here, Dave, if um, you're ready. Well, ready? I'm actually going to pause for a second. Your sound got a little warbly. So we're going to pause and see if, briefly if we can't fix this. Hang on one second. All right, we're back. Take us to the next one, John, if you would, please. Ah, back on track. So let's see. Our next one is from Steve. And his question is, on an iOS device, does moving mail from the inbox to the junk mail folder mark that mail as spam? Question mark. <laughs> if not, is there a way to mark mail as junk on an iOS device? I know how to do it on a Mac, but I find myself not using my Macs much these days. Interesting. And the answer is, Dave, at least with iCloud, and this is because Apple says so. Yep. Um, doing that, in fact, does qualify as actually reporting junk mail. And they have a little ditty called Identify and Filter Junk Mail in iCloud. And in that section, they say one of the ways you can do this is by moving it into the junk folder. So it's different UI wise, I think, uh, annoyingly so, between uh, Mac and iOS. But yes. It'll do that. And as far as I know, Dave, Gmail does that too. If you if you move things, it makes it smarter. But my experience the last time I used Yahoo Mail was that it just didn't get it. Huh. At the very least, you would think dragging something that's from weird address or has a certain subject would kind of flag it as I assume that's part of what they do when you uh, Yeah. Remember. Yeah. I would yeah. Hey, Gmail definitely does that. Um but it it can be a little weird. Um, I I had Gmail flagging all of my mail from FedEx as spam, yeah. which was annoying because you know I like to get my uh, my my notifications from FedEx, you know. Uh, and I in order to fix that, like I I went in and I would I would move them in mail, and then I went into the web interface and was like, no, not spam, not spam, not spam. It didn't matter, didn't matter, didn't matter. And um, finally, I had to set up a rule in Gmail that said any messages from, you know, I think it was this address or to this, I don't know, whatever it was. It was like, do not ever mark as spam. And then it was like, oh, okay, gosh, I, I didn't, I didn't know you felt that way. You know, it was mm -hmm. fine. So, yes, yes, yes. So there you go. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. We good? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, all right, let's, uh, moving right along here. We will go from Steve to Chuck. Chuck, actually, it, I think this is a geek challenge. I, I don't know that there's an answer for it yet, but it, there should be. Chuck says, I've started taking a lot of video and using it on Facebook. Is there an easy way to edit the video on an iPad to add subtitles? What I really want is a service where I can pay a small fee and they just add the subtitles. Does anything like this exist? What a great question. I don't know uh, what the answer is to this because I, I, I mean, you can, you know, you can do it manually, but um but not easily. Like, I don't know of any easily easy way to do it manually. And f especially for posting videos on Facebook and, and YouTube, like if, if you're doing like a how to or something, having subtitles is huge because a lot of times people can't listen to sound and having subtitles there can really kind of, you know, bring people in with the, uh, with the sound off automatically. I don't uh, any thoughts on that, John. I mean, I did a search and I came up with 10 free useful subtitle maker tools, but it, it looks kind of shifty to me. So shifty. I'm, any any of them for iOS? <laughs> no, it's mostly Windows stuff. No, I just I just typed in subtitle creation and, and, and getting things that claim to do this in some fashion. But I mean, none of, none of the high end uh, video editing tools do that. I mean, it's. N well, none of the high end. Well, it's, I don't know what I don't know what we qualify as high end pricey, um, maybe. But um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Brian Monroe just pointed to uh, a Google support page, a YouTube support page that says um, you can use automatic captioning. 
YouTube can use speech recognition technology to automatically create captions for your videos. If automatic captions are available, they'll automatically be published on the video if you uh, if you turn that on. So that's actually pretty cool. So that's what I was thinking of. Though I was having problems expressing it, is yeah, so, something could automate this doing a speech recognition. Yeah, oh, that's cool. I'll put any. I'll put a uh, a link to that in the show notes because that would be YouTube automatic captioning. Cool. Yeah, I was wondering if any of the video editors had a, a you know something that could do that for you and apply it since the video is in the tool. Well, why not apply the subtitles to the movie? Right. Cool. Right. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah, as Brian Monroe says in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream, use the power of the Borg. So well, I like that. That works. Yeah. Yeah. The assimilation thing's really not personal. No. They just want to improve the quality of life for all beings. For like all beings. quote from one of them. Yeah. That, that's yeah. what they're all about. That's all they mean. That's right. Just like us. Just like us. It's what we did. It's correct. Wait, we're the Borg? <laughs> I didn't know. Good Borg. <laughs> we're the good Borg. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, Nathan had a good little tip. He said, uh, recently I got caught, as did Dan in the Mac Geekab Facebook group at MacGeekab.com slash Facebook uh, and Bill in episode 699. Our symptoms all overlap, though not perfectly, where the finder gets wonky in various ways that make you less functional on your Mac. I believe the other symptoms are caused by the finder not seeing files, which are, in fact, still on your internal SSD. Relaunching the finder helped us, but only temporarily until the problems recur. What we have, what we three have in common is that we're running Drive Genius 5, which means Drive Pulse is running 24-7 from the menu bar. My working theory is that the current version of Drive Pulse doesn't get along with High Sierra and or APFS, and they booger each other up technical terminology at some point when drive pulse is running in the background both dan and i have gotten back to happier functioning on our macs just from temporarily not running drive pulse for a full week now i've started a support case with the drive genius uh, prosoft folks and they're not admitting to anything yet but it's worth a shot for bill or anyone else to try it sure beats doing a nuke and pave of mac os reinstalling everything and then possibly experience this experiencing the same headaches again Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing this, Nathan. That that's very interesting, and uh, I I would assume if it is Drive Genius, it certainly seems like it is. Uh, I would assume that it's an APFS related thing, um, you know. And uh, like this is a new file system, so we've got to expect this kind of stuff. Uh, hopefully, yep. And go while ahead, you were gone, yeah. Dave, yes. they actually released an update. Aha! Drive Genius Five. Okay. And one of the items in the update dialogue, I, I can't find the release notes online. Yep. Um, and I can't bring up the dialogue again. But yeah, one thing suggested that they were more intelligently handling some drive corruption errors, like the ones I ran into. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was just me. So I think they just realized, all right, if we see this error, it's really not an error. I Got think, it. I haven't had it come up already. But yeah, they're they're constantly improving it, which is uh, a plus as they learn more as they learn more too yeah 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 well this came in on saturday this this email from nathan's but uh who knows maybe maybe that that will fix it there you go cool uh while we're on the tips bandwagon here why don't we go to patrick patrick uh says in episode 697, John F. Braun relayed his story of purchasing a new iPhone. Here's my cool stuff found. My wife and I wanted to upgrade our iPhone 6s to iPhone 8s. We're with AT&T, so we went to the store because of their buy one, get one free promotion, only to find that we couldn't do this because we were not adding a line. So we left. But later, we went to an AT&T authorized reseller. The salesperson was fantastic and told us if we were willing to cancel uh, one phone line and add another, we could get the buy one, get one free promotion. Now, it's not easy to change your phone number, but my wife said she would do it. So we each got our iPhone 8 256 gigs, but uh, we'll only be paying for one of them. If you're in this situation, just go to one of the authorized resellers instead of the company stores. So that's interesting. I wonder if you could have added a third line and then transferred the number from line two, you know, to line three and then canceled line two. 
like, and kept your phone number throughout this, uh, this little thing. I don't, I don't know if they would have let you do that, but you know, uh, it's a thought. There's always a way to, yeah, I had the, the same thing. The guy was like, well, you know, we have a deal, you know, when I was upgrading my phone, he's like, well, we have a deal where you can get two phones if you get unlimited. It's like, yeah, I, I, I only, I only need one. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, uh, Barry, Barry says uh, in the chat room, he says, I asked, I tried to do that. You definitely lose a number. So, mm. yes, yes, yes. All right. Uh, and where are we here? Oh, yeah. David has uh, potentially a tip for us. All right. Uh, and David writes. Uh, I'll find it. It's the right one. Oh, per a recent episode, he said Dave mentioned about Apple deprecating AFP, Apple File Protocol, and one should start using SMB, uh, server messaging block, I think. Is that right, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Sounds right. Yeah. Uh, he said, I recently had two incidents where using SMB would, for some reason, lose the mount point. It would just unmount with no explanation or message, uh, which then caused all software to fail uh, and things like that. He says, I use Carbon Copy Cloner and Plex, and when the share goes away, that's bad. Uh, he said switching to AFP solved the problem, whereas you can re reproduce the issue connecting with SMB nearly every time. It seems to me that Apple's implementation of SMB has problems under load over an extended period of time, like when Carbon Copy you know, Cloner is doing a NAS backup or Plex is doing a rescan. I figured this out while working with some engineers from Carbon Copy Cloner who couldn't pinpoint it either and have no explanation why AFP would work and SMB would not. My suggestion is if, if you have switched to SMB and begin to see odd issues or failures, switch back to AFP and try again. Huh? All right. There you go. I've never, I don't know that I've had any issues like that, John. Have you? Sometimes with my Drobo. Okay. If I try to connect with SMB, in which case I see the name of the volume in all lowercase, and then I say connect, a lot of times I'll connect and they'll be like, oh, I can't find the thing you, had, you know, I just connected to. And it's like, huh? And also I find some, you know, some things like I think uh, some of the extended attributes, you don't know, see like the colors and stuff like that if you connect with SMB versus AFP. Right. But I think it's just the implementation on, on the Drobo here. I mean, for, for a lot of times it, it works fine, but every now and then it glitches and then... Sure. To project yep. and then try again and then it works. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Try again and it works. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. Uh, Brian Monroe says, yeah, that'll work as long as AFP is still supported, but who knows? Sometime it might go away. That's what happens to deprecated stuff. All right. Uh, John, I want to uh, take a minute and talk about our sponsors. If that works for you, is that cool? Very cool. Mobileform.com. Oh, you know, I screw this up every time, John. And uh, we're going to try this again. I'm going to get it right. Are we good? Are we good, John? Yes. All right. Our first sponsor for today is Roboform, where at Roboform.com, you can go and download Roboform, this awesome password manager today. And of course, it's... Like a lot of things these days, you can use it on one machine for free. And then they have a service called RoboForm Everywhere that lets you sync all of your passwords and, you know, emergency logins and all of that stuff. And of course, that's where they make their money. And you can save some money because coupon code MGG saves you 10 bucks off of your RoboForm Everywhere subscription for a limited time. So, RoboForm, we all know that we shouldn't be using the same password everywhere, right? We all know that, say, with, we all know that we shouldn't be using the same password everywhere, right? RoboForm solves that problem for you. Not only does it store all your passwords so that you can access different passwords for different sites, it needs to be convenient and they make it convenient, but it also will generate stronger passwords, saves them automatically, then it lets you log in with a single click. You can securely share logins, including emergency access, which allows you to create a trusted emergency contact to have access to your data in case something happens to you. If you travel a lot, this is something you should be thinking about. It's available for Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, Chrome OS, and Linux with support for all their respective major browsers, including even Microsoft Edge, if you have to use that. You got to check it out. 
roboform.com coupon code MGG saves you off of uh, saves you 10 bucks off of roboform everywhere a subscription for a year an individual subscription is just 19.95 save 10 bucks you can do the math that's less than half price you got to check it out visit roboform.com use coupon code MGG our thanks to roboform for sponsoring this episode our next sponsor is jamf we're at j a m f that's how you spell jamf dot com slash mgg you can go and get a free account that gets you three devices in jamf for free forever forever not like for a limited time unless you know forever's limited time and then i i got nothing for free forever three devices you can manage your apple devices remotely Or you can manage somebody else's Apple devices remotely. Of course, they have to give you permission. But this is great if you run a business and you need to set things up. You can configure like Wi-Fi settings and email settings. You can even remotely wipe a device if, you know, heaven forbid you have to. Right. And it works on your Macs. It works on your iPads. It works on your iPhones. You can do this. I mean, it's free for three devices. So you can do it for your family if you want. Or you can do it for your business, or you can do it for both. And it doesn't just have to be the family that lives in your house, because this is remote. So you can do it for people all over the world, as long as they have access to the internet. Very, very, very cool stuff. You got to check this out. Like You should start using this for your family right away, because you get three devices for free forever. So just do it. Go visit jamf.com slash mgg. And then after those three devices, it's just two bucks per device per month. That's it. Check it out. Jamf.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Jamf now for sponsoring this episode. And Dave. Yes. Amazingly, uh, we didn't plan this at all. It's just a strange coincidence here. But um, the upcoming question may involve um, something like Jamf. We didn't plan this. It just happened, man. It, that's actually so true. I, I mean, we, we, I noticed it after we built the agenda, but there you go. Yeah. So um, Adrian writes, I'm the IT guy for my large family of seven. We all have iPads and other iOS devices. Is there any software you would recommend something like Champ now that would allow me to manage these devices? Do, do things like run updates, manage parental controls, et cetera. And the answer is yes. So one, I know this, Dave, because I'm, I'm working on a, a... Yeah, you're doing a deep dive on that stuff. A little ditty on a, how to use a iOS to, a, or a Mac OS profile manager to do some of this stuff. And it's, a, it's pretty darn cool. So, but my answer to him in, includes that and some other things. So what do we mean when we talk about managing devices? And really, it is the creation of something called a configuration profile. And actually, Apple has a spec on this. And it's basically your way of telling a device to observe certain behavior, restrictions, network settings, all that great stuff. The first thing that does it, Dave, and it's absolutely free, is Apple Configurator 2. Okay. Um, right. And that creates these files. And, um, you know, that doesn't, doesn't really provide much in, in the management aspect in that you can configure them. But, you know, if you're, if you're talking lots of, options and people it can get to be a chore sure and you do it by a usb cable and it's only for ios devices okay the next thing now is something like mac os server because it has something called profile manager and it it deploys something that we're going to call mobile device management okay and that's what jamf and other things are as well and that has a component where instead of plugging in devices individually it configures them using security and certificates and um, also, it does it over a network, whether it be Wi-Fi or wired, even if it's on the Internet. So that's the cool part, too. Oh. And Mac OS Server does that. Um, but as pointed out, there are several other products. And, and I would say a good strategy, which worked for me, Dave, is, you know, I typed Apple and MDM, mobile device management, into Google. And it came up with the Jamf, and it came up with Mac OS Server, and it came up with a report that listed like 10 of them and stuff. So, hmm. Cool. There's a lot of options there. Yeah, yeah. But um, like I think I saw Komodo even offers it, which is like, well, why not? They do certificates, which is kind of a part of this whole device management equation. So um, really, do Komodo that, has an, a mobile device management yeah thing. Who knew? Look at that. DM.komodo.com. 
There you go. I mean, we get our certs from them. <laughs> uh, yeah, but and this will work on on iOS devices too. Well, I mean, the, the files are the same between iOS and Mac. So actually, Mac can support profiles as well, though. Right, but Komodo doesn't server. support the Mac. Komodo is Windows, iOS, and Android. But I, I mean, but it's iOS. I mean, I had no idea. That's interesting. okay because I did get a hit. It's like, yeah, we can we can do some of this for you. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah MDM they the is, search, so is, they so they right. piggyback something up, up, off of their you know cert infrastructure. And, huh. So you've been digging into this a little bit. I I I, I want to. I don't want to derail us if there's more to say about the question here, but I'm, I'm curious, like what, how, what have you dug into here? Like, like I, I, I'm, I want to learn. Well, part of it is, um, you know, the whole certificate infrastructure. And at least uh, if you do it yourself with Mac OS, you can do a self signed. And the thing is it takes care of it. So you don't get warnings and, you know, freak out and stuff like that. But then it's really about, you know, what do you want to deploy? Like the, the thing that I like doing just, because it has such a sudden impact is uh, one of the things you can do is put many restrictions on a device. Sure. Like one thing I said is, well, disable the camera. And it's like, okay. And so, you know, it communicates over the internal or internet and all of a sudden your camera goes away. And it's like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> huh. But parental and so controls, how do you did network that, setting. You did that with Mac OS servers profile manager? Yes. Isn't that cool? And then it just, and that's it, right? It just turns off the camera. So you set it up. There's a, a part of the uh, control panel that shows the progress of the task. And okay. sometimes it gets stuck, especially with the push. Yeah. Because everything had to kind of get in place. It's like the first time I tried it, it's like waiting, waiting. And it's like, oh, interesting. Well, there's some magic happening. I mean, push notifications actually seem to be. Oh, yeah. All of this goes through Apple's time. push servers. Right, right, right. Yeah. And they don't work all the time because we, well, they, I mean, they, they, right. There's sometimes a delay. I've seen that when we send out like, you know, um, for those of you that don't know, we have a Mac Geek Cab iOS app. And of course, you can listen to the show in the Mac Geek Cab iOS app, but you can also uh, get notifications from us like when a new show is starting, but also when the live stream starting. And yes, you can listen to the live stream and even participate in the chat inside the app. The app's free. You should you should go get it if you're, uh, um, you know, use an iOS device works on iPhone and iPad. But, um, you know, those push notifications, we've used various different, I'll call them front end services because the back end is always Apple's push notification server for that. And we just feed it to it in some way. We could even write our own front end for that. It doesn't matter. But once you feed it to Apple server, it's like, okay, now like, wait, we'll, we, we've got it from here. So that's it. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty cool, man. But describing what you can do, I mean, a lot of it is stuff that's already in the system preferences. It just makes it real easy, especially. Yeah, if, of course. You know, so you would probably guess everybody in the household is going to connect to the same, uh, you know, Wi-Fi server and have the same password. Well, you can distribute a, you know, little configuration that sets that up or even prioritize prioritizes things oh, then you can do yeah. restrictions so i think the the two parts of it are really uh, restrictions for whatever reason whether it be to keep your kids out of trouble or yep. you know you're a top secret black ops uh you know <laughs> whatever you're doing there that we don't want to know about um right <laughs> especially again turning off the camera is just to me brilliant there's no way to get to the camera if you say turn off the camera it's just right Right. You know, well, I, like I mean, you the could camera app and it's like, nope. And I'm like, well, yeah, you could remove the profile f from your phone there. And the thing is, I'm, I'm looking into that because the thing is, they claim to have the ability to password protect the ability to do that. Of course. But I found that it doesn't work. Oh, really? Because oh. I was able to delete it. And it's like, well, I applied a password to this. Why, why didn't you ask for it? So, yeah, right. Huh. It looks like they have the hooks in there, but it doesn't work. And the thing is, my understanding, though, is that if you do it with the, is that you can password protect the files if you use the configuration. Uh, Apple Configurator will let you password protect the profiles. Okay. Okay. Oh, that, oh I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I huh. thought of that, too. Yeah. And the thing is, you, you, I mean, yeah, you could say it's a crummy model because, you know, the owner of the device can delete the profiles. Yeah, no, I I think those passwords work. I I mean, obviously, I know you you ran into an issue with it, but I, it, like that is a thing. I've done it with um, 
with like with with Jamf, I think I was pretty sure it was with Jamf where like once I locked it in, like you can't move it. And and that's sort of the point. Like if it's a company owned device, you don't want an employee to be able to necessarily, you know, like just strip that and go rogue and do whatever they want with their with their iPhone. So, yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, Dave Ginsburg is saying he used Jamf now to remove the camera from the phone. Oh, that's pretty cool stuff, man. All right, cool. Well, I'm you're putting together an article for us at TMO about that. Is that right? Uh, yes, Maybe. probably more than one. Oh, the wow, first one cool. is how do I, how do I set up, and then it's like, all right, now what do we do? Yeah, right. set up. It gets uh, uh, there are ways. Ways there to get yourself you into trouble, take, which I took. I got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> got it. Well, that's always how it is. That's like, that's perfect. Cool. Hey, um, when we started the show, you were talking about scheduled restarts of your uh, Mac and you happened to mention scheduled restarts of an iPhone. Uh, as I mentioned, there is uh, a little tale of woe that Dennis had. And he said, uh, I have, uh, where are we here? Oh yeah. I have a 2017 iMac with a 27 inch 5k display running high Sierra. Um, he says, uh, he talks through his network and all of that. None of which mattered as we found out. He says, I have iMazing backing up my iPhone and iPad and my wife's iPhone and iPad at five to 6 AM in the morning each day. I keep seeing iMazing indicating that it crashed every couple of days. I shared this with the iMazing team and they said they couldn't reproduce it. I dug into it further and was monitoring LSOF, which you can do from the terminal uh, for iMazing and noticed that there was an increasing set of sockets in a close weight state. My theory is that it keeps increasing that until the app crashes. I've also shared this with iMazing. Uh, and he, he said they had me check to see if I was using any firewalls or anything like that. Um, and then he wrote back. He said, the problem is not identified, but it's solved. Amazing said it may be due to not having multicast enabled on my network. He's like, but I'm not sure that's it. He says, after looking at the data I collected from LSOF for iMazing on the iMac, I noticed the open sockets that were in closed weight uh, and increasing were only for one of the three devices being backed up. I tried to watch the console of the iPad with iMazing because that was the one being affected. But just like a Mac, if you aren't sure what is normal, you'll get lost in the details. So being relatively confident that it was that iPad, I did a reset by holding down the power and home button until the iPad restarted. I then restarted iMazing and started monitoring again. And now the open sockets for iMazing seem to be relatively constant, like I was seeing on my laptop. So if any of your listeners are having iMazing crash restart, uh, if left running for more than a few days, this could be the cause and the solution. So very interesting that really the answer was restart your iPad. And, you know, it's interesting because we always uh, we do talk about how uh, I certainly restart my Mac every week. I don't have it scheduled yet, although I, I do kind of like this idea, John. But um, I always notice that if I'm having wonky problems with my Mac, invariably, I, I'll look at, you know, the uptime and iStat menus or whatever. And it'll say, oh, yeah, it's been running, you know, eight days, nine days, 10 days. It's like, oh, yeah, OK. And then I restart and everything's like hunky dory again. And it seems to be that seven day mark really for me. And I've got 32 gigs of RAM on on that machine. Like it's not running out of RAM or anything like that. It's just, you know, things have been running for a while and it gets wonky and you got to start from scratch. So that restart and with an SSD, those go pretty quickly, uh, really helps solve it. But we don't do this for our iPhones, or at least I don't think to do it for my iPhone. The only time I restart my phone is either if it has a problem or if uh, I get a software update that, you know, forces a restart. So I, I'm starting to think that I want to do a weekly reboot of my iPhone, just like I do on my Mac. I mean, it's the same <sighs> operating system at the core, right? I mean, it's, you know, BSD. Uh, well, kind of, but. You know, it's like kind of thrown in the towel because the thing is, you know, uh, iOS is a subset. I mean, it's not a desktop operating system and it doesn't. No, no, no. But, but I mean, at the, at but, the um, core, but my it's expectation BSD. is that something like that. Yeah. You know, it's not an embedded device, though I would expect that from those. But things that are relatively less complex than a desktop PC, I would expect to not require that maybe as often. I'll, I'll, 
I'll settle on that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, you're running all the, the like, or I'm running a lot of third party apps on my phone. And yes, they're mm-hmm. sandboxed, whereas on the Mac, you know, many things are not sandboxed. So, but even still, it's like, it's that whole memory management thing where it's like eventually. Well, I definitely had start to from scratch. I've definitely had to whoosh some apps away because they got stuck. It's just like totally non-responsive. And then I, you know, yep. double tap and it's like, oh, well, okay. Everybody else is happy. So away with you. Away. That's right. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've got a couple of things to go through here. The first one I'm going to say though, is um, I, I'm, I, I'm becoming le- especially after traveling and at South by Southwest this week, I am becoming less and less enamored with um, face ID because it's slow compared to touch ID where it just happens right away the, it, there there are a lot of times where I feel like I'm waiting for face ID. And certainly if I'm trying to do something where I don't necessarily want to hold my phone up to do things with it, it's kind of a pain in the neck. Like I like typing in the password is often what has to happen. So I like there's, yeah. there's work that needs to be done on face ID here. It's uh, I'm not sure what the, what the deal is, but you know, uh, but there you go. That's, that's what I, that's what I'm thinking about face ID. It's adapting. I, guess. I, don't, I don't know. It's not adapting in the right of, direction. A lot of parameters there, you know, especially, you know, you're, you're in a unusual environment, not a South by Southwest per se, but you yeah. know, lighting and. and yeah, right. Like well, that. that's what it is. Especially yeah. stage lighting and all that stuff I can imagine would be. Yep. A, well, just like with a normal camera, it's like uh, a lot of them can't deal. It can't deal. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought it was infrared, so should that light really affect? Well, that? but Maybe heat. Not. I I had oh, a lot of times. Well, heat is infrared. Yeah, that's. I had a lot of times where, um, if I had my glasses on, Face ID wouldn't work. Which I know it it like I mean, these are just like acrylic f- frame glasses, but I don't know what it was screwing it up. But I'd take them off, and everything would be fine. They polarized. Yeah. They are. No, these weren't even sunglasses. No, I was having problems with just regular, you know, I, I, I wear glasses for some distance stuff, a lot, especially when I'm seeing a band. Like I, you know, I like to see everything. And so I wear glasses anyway. I don't know. Um, while we're talking about South by Southwest, I, I want to throw a couple things out there. I did get to see um, both at Apple's Eddie Q speak uh, toward the beginning of the week. And then the day before that, I got to see Elon Musk speak, which was interesting. Um, he said, I, I always thought he was terrible on stage watching his, you know, streaming videos of the, of them doing product announcements or whatever, but he was, he was really good. Um, it was just a fireside chat. He was really personable and, uh, affable and very well-spoken. And, you know, he's a, like, he's a, I know we all know he's a smart dude, or at least I knew he's a smart dude. What I didn't know is how much engineering he still winds up doing. He said when he started SpaceX or at one point they needed to hire a chief engineer, but they couldn't af- afford a good one and he didn't want to pay for a bad one. And uh, so he became the chief engineer. Like, that's pretty impressive. Like, he literally just willed himself into being a rocket scientist. That's pretty good, you know. And he said even now, like 80 to 90% of his time at SpaceX is still spent on... Uh, on engineering. Like somebody else runs the business. That's pretty impressive, right, man? Not bad. I mean, it looks like he has a basic education, but hey, I know. Motivation. Hey, motivation. Well, motivation and intelligence, I would I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got to have you got to have the building blocks. <laughs> and some dumb luck sometimes, and, you know? and totally dumb luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least I I've looked at my life and uh some things are dumb luck. Some things are totally dumb luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yes. Um, to ask the question in the chat room. Yeah. Musk is getting better at public speaking. I think it like I need to see his next product announcement to see like if that part of it has gotten better. But it was good. And then I saw I saw Eddie Q um, at South by Southwest as well. He what's he do? He's uh, I forget what his title is at Apple, but, you know, C-suite at Apple. He, he was he was in charge of iTunes 
um, for a long time, and and now he's uh, actually still Let's kind see. of uh, senior vice president of Internet Software. Internet Software. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he, um, I, I've you know, again, I've seen him on stage doing product announcements many, many times, and you know, he's fine. He's sort of like your. You know, he's kind of like like Schiller in the sense that he's your kind of funny uncle up there and doing his thing and, you know, kind of kind of a goofball. And that's OK. But uh, but obviously, you know, a very astute guy and a good negotiator with with all the deals that he's pulled together. But um, it was it, it, he was interviewed by Dylan Byers, I want to say. Maybe I've got the first name wrong at CNN. And um it was a weird interview. It wasn't all that great um, because the guy kept asking Eddie to divulge secrets about, you know, Apple's future products. And the first time he asked him, Eddie said, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to be at Apple this year. will mark 30 years. He said, I'd like to work another 20 there. Uh, we've got some great things going on. So um, because I want to work another 20, I'm not going to tell you about any uh, secrets that we have, you know, and that was funny, but uh and beyond that, it, I don't know, it just, it, it didn't really go anywhere. It was kind of a weird, weird interview, but I don't know. It was fine. It was good to see Eddie Q. Cool that they, you know, they can pull that kind of, uh, those kind of heavyweights in for a show like that, which is good. Uh, any questions about any of that before? Yeah, I, I thought his shirt saw? was uh, kind of subdued. Oh yeah. Sometimes his shirt's a little crazy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Um, I will say this South by Southwest is also, I mean, it's, it's the, what do they call it? The South by Southwest conference and festivals. And uh, you know, there's the music festival that goes on. You can listen to today's uh, gig gab at gig where I talked all about how the music festival works. It's also a film festival. And a lot of times those things will kind of mix together. So there'll be music films or tech films or this, that, and the other thing I did see a movie and the frustrating part about what I'm about to do here and tell you about this movie is that you can't see it yet because it was a film festival. So it was there to hopefully get exposure and, and like funding and, and then, you know, maybe it'll come out. And I think this one will come out. It's a film called science fair. It's a documentary about the international science fair. And it chronicles the story of like five or six different like people in groups that, that, you know, create something, high school students that create something and, and go on to the International Science Fair. Documentary, one of the best movies I've ever seen. I cried, I laughed, I cheered. This movie is fantastic. It's like, I can't wait to see it again. Uh, it won, um, South by Southwest does audience awards for all their films. And I happened to see this one on the last day, which meant that the awards had already been announced. They do awards in every category and, you know, things like that so that they can highlight lots of different films. This was the one that won like the overall best audience award film of the week. I think I, you know, because they had shown it a couple of times before and, and people were able to vote. Truly amazing. Like absolutely stellar film. Uh, highly recommended it. It I I learned so many things about the National Science Fair that I had no idea about. Um just the, I mean, I, I suppose, or the international science fair, I should say, I suppose I knew that it existed. That's pretty much where my knowledge ended about this thing. And it's really amazing what some of these high schoolers are able to pull together. It's really I, like highly recommend it. And I think they wouldn't say where they, like it, by the end of the week, you know, it had gotten a lot of buzz. And so uh, somebody asked, you know, where can we see it again? They, they said, well, we don't have anything to announce yet, but, and they basically described like, it's going to be on Netflix or something like that. Maybe Amazon prime. They said, it'll be somewhere that everybody that wants to see it could see it, which is good. So science fair. There you go. Uh, really, really great movie. So, um, uh, that's what I got about that. I have a, a, a tale of woe and, and I learned something, John at, uh, at, at, at just one thing. No, I learned a lot of things. It's my tale of woe isn't finished. So my tale of woe, remember the last episode I mentioned to you that we dropped off my son's uh, iPhone seven at the Apple store, the iPhone seven that my son's using. It's actually my old one because it update. Well, it had, yeah, it had that firmware problem, right. Or motherboard problem where it, it couldn't update the firmware. Right. Uh, and Apple said, Oh yeah, it's covered. No problem. You'll have it back in three to five days. 
I still don't have this phone back, by the way. And we recorded that episode before I left. So it's been, I think today is day 11 since we, uh, yeah. So, you know, middle of the week, my son's texting me. He's like, have you heard anything about the phone? It's like, oh yeah, kiddo. What? Okay. So I checked in with Apple. They're like, oh yeah, it's processing. Okay, fine. The next day I check in I'm like, yeah, it's still like, what's going on here? And it took a, it took a while. It actually was until, wasn't until Saturday. So we had dropped the phone off Thursday. This was a week later, Saturday that I finally had some time. I was like in my hotel room in the early evening, packing up my stuff. Cause I was flying out Sunday and I had some time to spend on, on chat with him. And I had done this chat thing a couple of times, but I finally dug into it with him and I got a little bit, uh, I don't know if I was irate, but I got pushy. That's for sure. And just said, what's going on? Like, wh where the heck is this phone? What's the story? And they kept saying, like, even when I checked with them earlier in the week, they're like, oh, yeah, there's a serial number problem, but we'll fix it. I'm like, what's the problem? Well, it turns out that when the tech at the store had logged the repair, he totally fat fingered the serial number. Like, they told me the first letter and the last four digits were the same as the phone that appeared at the depot, the repair depot, but nothing else in the middle was even close. So I don't know what the guy did, but everybody that looked at it knew that, oh yeah, he just screwed it up. And then on Wednesday, um, so this was six days after the repair happened or after it was dropped off on Wednesday, the store was emailed by the depot because as it turns out, when a repair originates, and this is the lesson for all of us here, when a repair originates at the store, the store is the owner of that repair, even if it's shipped off and it's never going to come back to the store. Like in this case, it's going to be shipped off to the depot and then the depot is going to send it to me when they fix it just at my house. But the store is the owner of that. And so the depot had emailed them saying, look, you guys screwed this up. I need you to just go in and acknowledge that this is, you know, this should be a different serial number. Just hit the OK button, whatever it is. And then the depot could do it. The store didn't check their email. Still on Saturday, the store hadn't replied to this email that was sent to him by the depot on Wednesday. And so Apple was apologetic about this, needless to say, thankfully. And they got customer relations involved. Now, for those of you that don't know, Apple's customer relations department, it, it's the name that they have for the thing that other companies call like office of the president, right? It's the the customer service ninja department, the people that are like that, that have a lot of authority to just fix like really bad problems. And you and I have dealt with customer relations uh, over the years. I think three or four times on this show in the past 13 years, you and I have talked about like I, I know for me, customer relations replaced and, and upgraded in the process to computers for me because there were major problems with them. And I think you had that with, yeah. a, with an iBook at one point, right? And the discussion is usually explaining what's happening and then say, dude, dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. They're, they're like reasonable people that become your advocates as long as the, the situation warrants it, you know? And, and so I got in touch with customer relations. In fact, they insisted that I talk to customer relations. I was getting frustrated. I'm like, you guys know what the problem is. Why do I need to be involved in fixing this? Like, why am I the one that has to beat down these doors? Why can't you guys fix your own internal problems? And finally, customer relations said, we will be those people. We'll take care of it. You don't have to waste any more time on this, sir. But that was only 24 hours ago. Uh, and, and, and it's being fixed. Like they finally got in touch with the store. They made the store check their email and all that stuff. But the interesting part is all my prior interactions with customer relations were such that the customer relations rep was like, had universal authority at Apple. They could just do whatever they wanted and get it done. And they said that that's still the case unless the repair is, is the problem, which of course this, in this case it is, unless it starts at the store, in which case the store has full authority and all customer relations can do is call the store and, and, you know, appeal to them and say, look, you've got to fix this. And, and then they can get it done, it, which, which is what happened. And I think my phone will ship out today. I hope that, you know, that's what we're waiting to hear back from. But this whole thing about the store being, like the linchpin or the, the, you know, the, the, the wall, the speed bump is really interesting. So my, 
um, the, the, the lesson that I've learned from this is if you have a repair that you know needs to be sent out, don't start with the store. Now, that, that's like very easy to say in retrospect, but um, because sometimes you just don't know. But remember, we talked last time about the Apple support app on iOS and how uh, like they were able to diagnose the phone. We have a different phone with the battery issue. They were able to do all that diagnosis inside the app. And then we're just going to ship it into them. Of course, we're waiting for this other one to come back because we're using that one as the spare. But, uh, you know, so I would say if you have a problem, I would start with chat support. Now, I will be starting with chat support first from now on, because that way it stays inside the Apple Care system and is a and and doesn't involve the store like the stores are all corporate owned but it seems like each store has their own i mean they have their own responsibilities they've got their own bottom line and they have their own authority for this stuff that comes into them and if they are being um you know these stores are are they're i mean they're built to deal with people walking in every day every moment of every day and so this kind of institutional memory at the store when something's lingered for like 10 days or once it leaves, they stop thinking about it. And as we saw, at least this particular oh. store didn't check their email. It's fascinating though, huh? And uh, again, Brian Monroe in the chat room for the win. He said, I would say also make sure you log all the serial numbers of all of your devices somewhere. And I swear I, w I had done that, but I did not have, at least not traveling with me this week. And uh, frankly, I don't know where it would be here if I didn't have it with me because all my notes are electronic. Um, I did not have a serial number of that iPhone 7 with me. And they asked me that once. They're like, do you know the serial number of this? Because that might help. I'm not sure if it would have helped or not. It seems like the store could have like held up the whole works again anyway. But, um, but Brian's right. Take a screenshot of that page in your iOS settings and save it away from somewhere. So it's fascinating though, huh, John, that this, the, that this is how the support system kind of works now. I had no idea. I suppose. Mm. You suppose. Uh, yeah. It's usually work for me. Oh, same. I mean, right. This is definitely one of those things where, I mean, it was an honest mistake that then cascaded into some, I, I don't want to say they're not honest mistakes, but some negligence in terms of, of, you know, them not checking their email and, and addressing this for days and days. But like, it's interesting. Very interesting. Another place. Oh no, you can't. Oh darn. Oh well. So no, I was just kind of distracted for a moment here. And I was like, you know, I thought you could get the serial numbers of all your devices logged into iCloud, but I just looked here and it blanks out the beginning so never mind uh, i thought that'd be a yeah, nice place yeah, yeah. to uh account for that yeah going to each device yeah yeah interesting yeah brian monroe says if you had a screenshot of that serial number page you could forward that to apple and they would have a better starting point i believe that i i believe that would have would have helped things for sure yeah yeah fascinating Fascinating stuff. So anyway, hopefully, and, and you know, as always, customer relations has been stellar to deal with. Uh, I've never had a bad experience with them. And, and that includes this one. They were apologetic and fast acting and, you know, took the reins and, and took responsibility. And it's great. So like, mm -hmm. all good. They said, we realized this didn't start in an Apple-tastic way, but I think it's going to end in an Apple-tastic way. So, they, yeah. say Apple they actually no, did. Man. They did say Apple-tastic. Oh. Yeah. I don't, I think that was sort of just that, that particular reps way of, of, you know, making funny. Ma yeah. 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 You know, just engaging. It was good. Was good. It was good. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, while we're here, I want to make sure we thank all of our premium subscribers that, uh, that contributed over the last week and a couple of days here, because, uh, without you, uh, without you and without our advertisers, you know, it just doesn't work. And so this, this part's about you. I want to thank, we had one-time contributions. We had a $5 contribution, contribution, easy for me to say, from Harvey S. And a $50 contribution from Rob A. Thank you both. And then on the monthly $10 plan, we had Scott F., John G., Barry F., James C., Joe S., Paul M., Ari L., Michael P., Bob L., Jeff P., 
John V, Stephen A, John D, Santiago M, Gary B, and Ken from Kailua. Thank you all. Uh, very much so. And then on the biannual $25 every six month plan, we have Stephanie E, EO Lake S, Joe S, David T, Dominico B, Mike F, Erica R, Graham M, Mike Z, Rick S, Craig R, and William P. Thanks to all of you. And uh, for anybody that, that's interested, of course, go to MacGeekGab.com slash premium. That's a good place to go. So very, very cool stuff that all of you contribute towards making happen here. So uh, you rock. Thank you. All right, John, you. you want to take us to Chuck? Oh, do you have something to say about the premium stuff? Oh, no. Just oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Squared. Thank you, Squared. There you go. You thank you, more. Squared. I like that. That's good. <laughs> All right. That'll be the, uh, uh, we'll see. All right. So Chuck <laughs> writes, last week, while in the U.S., I received the software update. Notice for High Sierra 10.13.3. However, I completed the update on February 26th in Japan. Hmm. All right. Is it possible that this update is a glitch brought on by time zone changes or Apple's update server confusion? The details appear identical if I run the update, will it recognize that my high Sierra is already up to date? And I've seen this before, Dave. So you see yeah, one it's... update and the, the wording of it, uh, including the, not only the name of it, but the uh, text is identical. And you're like, well, they appear to be the same. My experience, Dave, is that as he suggested, I think it's server confusion. <clears throat> oh, but yeah, I also have be. seen, and I know at least one time in the past, Dave, there was an update that they glitched in a major fashion. Yeah. And they pushed out of the one. They just left the wording the same because it's like, yeah, we screwed up and uh, just just download this again. Okay. Just go get it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh. So it, um, it could be either one. Um, an interesting thing you may want to check out in the future and that this digs into the innards of the... Um, OS, or it gives you more detail. So if you go to the Apple menu, about this Mac, overview, you see where it shows the version of the OS, Dave? Well, if you click on that, it'll give you an extra secret code that only we know about. <laughs> it's the build number. But right. In my case, I just clicked on it. It's 17D as in Dog. Dave. Dave. I know that guy. <laughs> Dave's not 102. here. 102. <laughs> So that's like a subversion number. So you can have 10.13.3, but you can have different build numbers. Oh, so, interesting. So you want to keep track of that because that that should not be the same between them. So they could have both been 10.13.3, Dave, but uh, I'm almost certain that, uh, or in the past when I've seen this happen, the, the build number would tell you that, yes, yeah, something is, is subtly different. Yeah. And also your the serial number of your computer appears here. So when we were saying in the, you know, when I was talking in the last segment about the, um, you know, the, the support request and having your serial numbers on file, shooting a screenshot of that screen would not be a bad thing to have around. So there you go. Yeah. 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 It used to be that they hid the serial number on the screen and you need to hit that version number again and then you'd get it. But now it's just displayed right there because there's no reason to hide it. Yeah, I remember you had to go through hoops to, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was no oh, reason yeah. for that silliness. Yeah. Guys. All right. Yeah. Who's guys. Who do we got here? <laughs> yeah. Dude. Let's, let's go to, um, let's go to David. This is an interesting one. Um, David writes, he said, uh, Oh, let me find where we are here. Right. There we go. Uh, I seem to have hit a wall after some very painful calls with Verizon and the conclusion that it is something within my network. I started down a path to figure out why after a period of time, nothing can get to the internet, no websites, no pings, nothing. I can move around my intranet just fine and even connect to the web admin page of the router. All look, all looks rosy and fine, except nothing works outside the land of the web. I've, Tried running network scans to see if I have some sort of rogue loop going on. Doesn't seem like it. I made sure all my devices are up to date on patches. And as a last resort, I just started unplugging stuff until either the network came back or I identified, I identified the culprit, culprit device. This has resulted in yet another path where I get about five devices unplugged without rebooting anything. And the network magically stabilizes. So then I started focusing on those five devices and came up empty. I then plugged them back in and bam, 
down it went. So I unplugged five other devices, and sure enough, it comes back to life. The point here is it doesn't seem to have anything to do with any single device, but the collective number of devices. In theory, the Verizon Quantum Router supports up to 255 IP devices and more on various subnets, but clearly I'm nowhere near that limit. I don't have anything crazy going on like multiple rooms doing HD streaming, gaming, or long batch processes across the network or to the cloud, though I do cloud backups at night. This all occurs during the day. I currently have 20 wired devices, not all on at the same time, uh, through a managed 24-port switch and an 8-port uh, power over Ethernet device on a separate 8-port switch, and then another 15 wireless devices from wireless sticks to iPhones to iPads, etc., he says, my gut is telling me that I'm overloaded, overloading the CPU on the router itself in some way, or maybe RAM or something else, but I have no way to confirm or test this given that it's a Verizon quantum router. He says, I purchased versus rent, and I have no visibility into the hardware. Verizon has looked at my router and even sent me a replacement, um, and from the router perspective, all seems happy and good. I'm at a total loss here, he says. Any thoughts? So this is an interesting one, John. Um, it's certainly possible to hit the, the CPU wall in a router, but I don't think that's what's happening here. And I, and, but I have seen it where, you know, and I don't know this router in particular, but in sort of in, gen, in general, routers often have Ethernet switches built into them. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times you'll get maybe a four port Ethernet switch for your LAN yeah. on the router. And then one then there's another port. However many you have, there's a there's an extra port that connects to your, you know, Internet or whatever. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if that's happening. But, but the back plane should always support at least the assumption that everybody's talking at the same time on that uh, yeah. switch, if you will. Correct. But I have seen it like most of the time that. Even though there's, you know, four ports that look separate from the fifth port, they're all on the same switch and it just like VLANs that switch so that one of them is the, the port to the WAN and the other is the, the local, you know, the four local ports. And I've I've seen it where when I have like a network loop before it craters my local network, it will stop my router from talking to the Internet. So I've, I've seen that, but I've had a loop going on. Now, it's possible David's got a loop going on too, because, you know, maybe it's two of the devices and it just happened to be one in the batch of first five and one in the batch of the second five. But I don't know. It feels like he's been troubleshooting this well and would have at least identified one device that was the problem as opposed to, well, I take five off and then magically it works. Um, it, it, but I will say this, if the network does have a loop and obviously we're just kind of, or I'm just speculating here. If the network does have a loop, that loop won't necessarily yield any ugly symptoms the moment the device that's looping is plugged back in. It takes a few minutes for the traffic to build up in the loop to where it craters it down. <clears throat> that's all. That That's that's what I have to say. Hmm. You got any thoughts yeah, about I'm this? I'm going to assume here... Um, the one thing I was going to toss out, but it doesn't sound like this is currently possible. So, so the Verizon thing is the router and it's connected to a switch and the wireless is being done through that. My thought is ditch that thing as the router, put it in bridge mode and get another router. But uh, yeah, I, I don't I, know if there's an inherent issue with this thing. It just doesn't do something right. And can, ha, ha, eliminating that would be another data point. To see it would be another data point. Yeah, it could be a problem with the 24 port switch that he has. Um, I, you, you know, reset everything. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like a lot of times when I have those kinds of problems, I power cycle my, my switches and then, you know, like the world just magically gets better. So <laughs> seriously. I, no, I'm with you. Yeah. No, I've had that too. Yeah. Or you, you have been self-inflicted wound. I still remember where I had two devices, one, my laser printer, which I rarely use, but I gave another device on my network, the same IP address and, yeah. When I turned them on, things got weird and, and power cycling the switch helped. <sighs> yeah. Eliminate the confusion because we're like, dude, there's like two things with the same address. What are you doing? Right. Yeah. Switches. It, it like there's that whole Mac address um, 
table that that switches have that relates IP addresses to MAC addresses and and like does all that magic. And sometimes it like the whole idea of a switch is to intelligently not send traffic to devices that don't need it. Right. So that it's more efficient. You're not like the hubs in the old days. Yeah, it's directed. It's directed. Yeah. Right. Hubs would just be where they were dumb. They would just barf data at all data at every port. Whereas. Oh, yeah. And I remember the graph, the little utilization. Yeah. graph. You got more collisions. The little graph would, would slowly go up to 100 and then you were done. Yeah. You get this. Yeah. But switches are really smart. It, well, maybe not really smart, but somewhat smart where they only send the data between the devices that need it. And so they can get confused. Um, I don't, again, I don't know. I don't know. But they oh, can, yeah. switches can also be smart. Like your smart switch, you've had it tell you when you had a loop or some problem, right? Or it would tell it, you if you had it a It has loop. advanced settings, which can look for stupid things happening. Yeah, that's pretty say. cool. Like some device all of a sudden starts barfing things onto the network it's like okay well that's uh this type of problem so let's yeah. uh, let's stop that let's just stop that <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so i don't i i i like your idea about you know replacing that i mean i yeah man it's tr solving these kinds of network issues is a major headache because it again because especially with loops they don't appear the moment you plug things back in and well, sometimes like unplugging them and plugging them back in solves the problem because of exactly this. Like when you unplug something from a switch, well, then it forgets what it knew about it. And when it comes back on it, it, right. you know, it reconfigures. So, yeah. And you can get a new toy to play with. And Sounds you like probably doesn't, if yeah. this thing's doing it for the number of devices he has, then I think a, a non mesh. Oh, Hey, get mesh. Yeah. Get well, something new. Come on. Does he? Oh no, that's <laughs> right. He, he didn't have mesh. That's right. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, um, speaking of mesh, Bob, uh, Bob writes, he said, how difficult is it to integrate the Eero mesh system with an AT&T U-verse residential gateway? Is this advisable? If I do add an Eero system, there are only four Ethernet ports on the AT&T residential gateway, and all of these are currently used. So how do I connect the Eero? Do I need an Ethernet switch to add more ports? Does the Eero have an Ethernet port to connect to my disk station? He's got a disk station, a transporter, an AT&T DVR, and then the a, a second connection for a remote DVR. Um, so the answer is, yeah, it's going to work together fine. And in fact, Eero has a, a page about using this with AT&T Uverse. But let's not let's not look at it directly as an Eero Uverse thing. Let's let's look at it as you know Uverse with any kind of mesh. Right. Um, the important thing to remember is that in this case, the Eero or any mesh uh, and the U-verse are routers and by default will be configured to do all the routing. And what that means is if you simply plug your Eero into your U-verse as it stands, it'll work, but you'll be in a scenario where both the U-verse and the Eero are handing out IP addresses and trying to route traffic. And that can wind up in a double NAT or even a parallel NAT uh, scenario where you've got things, you know, it, it becomes a management headache. The best thing to do is to have only one device acting as a router and then have the other one in bridge mode. And with the AT&T Uverse stuff, you can certainly put the Eero in bridge mode. You can put the AT&T Uverse device. It's not quite bridge mode, but it's a pass all traffic to that device mode, which is pretty close to bridge mode. And, Again, Eero's got a website that, you know, an FAQ entry that explains all this stuff. So that's that's where I would go with it. Um, but uh, I would I would try it with the U-verse in bridge mode um, if you want the Eero to do all your routing. If you like all the routing that the U-verse does, then by all means, put the Eero in bridge mode. That's kind of what I'm doing right now here is I've got the Synology router doing the routing and then the Eero's in bridge mode doing all my Wi-Fi. And uh, the world is happy. It's fine. So um, it, it really just depends on how you want to configure it, but put one of them in bridge mode and the other one um, can be your, your router and then you're in good shape. As far as Ethernet, uh, if you if you choose to have the AT&T Uverse thing in 
uh, as your router, then kind of what you have now is fine. You'll need to, you'll need to remove one of your ethernet devices from the Uverse to plug the, the Eero in, but then the Eero has two ethernet ports. So you could plug another one in and just have it essentially do a pass through. Um, as long as the Eero's in bridge mode, that'll work fine. If the Eero is not going to be in bridge mode, if the Eero is going to be your router, then you can have nothing plugged in to the AT&T Uverse modem except for the one Eero. And then you'd have to plug the Eero into an Ethernet switch that everything else uh, is plugged into. You kind of have to have it all behind whatever the router is. Otherwise, it can't route. Right? Am I, uh, am I right on that? There can be only one. Well, there should be only one. Kind of. Yeah. No, I know. I've, I've never used one of these gateways. So. Right. Yeah, as long as they kind of enable you to do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's nice. Yeah, it's the kind of thing. Brian, uh, in the chat room, oh, man, dude, you are like rocking it today. Uh, he says, you have to be careful about that as the U-verse will not let the TV stuff work in bridge mode. So you got to make sure you coordinate with at and <sighs> to to get things working the right way. You might. You might not, uh, it might not work the way you want it to work. Yeah. Cause you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. 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 I guess that's, yeah, that's really what it is. Where are we on time here? Oh, we're getting close to the wall here. Uh, is there anything else we want to do today, John? I'm not, I'm not sure if there's, maybe we should do Bob, Rob real quick here. Harvey's kind of mysterious. We need more information. We need more information. Okay, so we'll skip Harvey and we'll we'll see if Rob can. Well, I want uh, you to try some stuff because okay. I tried some stuff and it was inconclusive, which is like, uh, All right. I hate that one when that happens, you know? I do, I do hate that one when that happens. All right, well, yeah, we'll talk about Rob. Harvey and we'll, we'll get something prepared for Harvey for next week, even though none of you know what Harvey's up to. Uh, Rob says, uh, oh, what does he have? He has uh, an issue. He's got a MacBook that will start to boot and he's tried it in verbose mode. He's tried it in safe mode. He's tried it in recovery mode. Um, most telling and they all get to the same point where before they finish booting, he gets a blank gray screen. Uh, most telling is that the verbose mode Mac or those verbose mode tests get past verbose mode. It comes up continues to boot, which is only a little bit left in the boot process. And then the same thing, gray screen. Um, he said it started a few weeks ago where his, it's a mid 2012 MacBook pro uh, started running some serious processes in the background, which was evidenced by iStat menus showing all four cores of the CPU maxed out. Um, he said before he got a chance to dig any further, he woke one morning to the machine powered down. So here's the thing. Um, certainly extra processes running in the background can max out your CPU. The other thing that can max out your CPU is when your system is trying to save itself from overheating. It will artificially report that the CPU is in use by some other process. It's usually kernel task. But it's not in use. It's just not letting other apps use the CPU in order to keep it from overheating. So I'm wondering if, in fact, what you saw was not the CPU in use by other processes, but the CPU in use by uh, kernel task, because maybe the fan uh, is not running and maybe it's overheating. So that's kind of my, my thought. He said he did do the Apple hardware test and that worked and it declared that all was well. And he said he also booted into single user mode and got the terminal prompt. Um, but again, that all kind of makes sense with, um, with a, a fan or, or even just a CPU issue. So uh, my thought, I don't know, John, you know, an external fan on this, put an external fan on this thing and, try and boot it and see what happens. I mean, it like, it seems like it gets far enough into the boot process, but then, you know, booting, especially with an SSD booting uses a lot of CPU because it's the only thing it's waiting for. So it, it's running full CPU for a long time and then just freezes. That, that's my theory. 
I'd be curious what happens if you try to boot from a backup. Oh, same thing. I didn't see that. Uh, maybe yeah. I that. Yeah, he said, but but also here. recovery mode, right, is a separate boot too. It's it's not the same operating system, right? But I, okay, I, uh, did he say he tried to boot from a backup? Yeah, uh, he that. definitely tried to boot from recovery mode. I'm pretty sure. Yes, no, I understand that, but I'm. Oh, he said he he tried to install he backup or he tried to boot from a clone. Yeah. Oh darn! Okay. Yeah, because my guess would be that the drive is shot. There's something uh, weird, wrong with the drive, and you should restore from a backup. Interesting. Yeah. No, he said he tried to boot from his clone and also his install key, his his you know, thumb drive. Yeah. So and that's uh, yeah. that's hardware. Mm hmm. Well, but that's the okay. So there you go. I I got to the same point. It's hardware, and then the alarm went off in my head mm -hmm. because my own saying is. When it's hard, when it seems like hardware, but it's really software, it's the SMC. So I think he should try oh, an okay. SMC reset and then maybe a PRIM reset. Yeah, they've done magic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So hopefully an SMC reset solves this. That's, that's, I mean, if, if there's going to be a magic fix, like you said, this is, yeah. this is where the magic Hasn't happens. fix my problem though. What's your problem? Yeah, the one with my mini where it, 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 it goes, it, it doesn't wake up. It goes to sleep. And then when I turn it on, it's like uh, sleep, wake failure. Oh yeah. Uh, was on, and I'm like, w what do you mean? That's not even the name of a thing. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is the same computer that sometimes is awake when you, uh, when you come in, right? Yeah. I, I mm. see it. it mm. It's trying to, I don't know. What's mm. up, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting, man. It's interesting. Poltergeist. It's poltergeist. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, John. Yeah, it's poltergeist, man. No, it's not. Is it the Borg? No, no. Is it the good Borg? There were some good Borg. Hugh and, and, and the rest. Yeah. All right. Yeah, they weren't all bad. Most of them. But... Q wasn't Borg. Was he? No, he wasn't. No, okay. All right. I thought you oh, just said Q. Oh, no, no. Oh. Q was Q. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but not like Q. There's right. There's Q and then there's Q. Right. Wasn't that weird? They they would call each other Q and it's like, well, wait. Huh? Whatever. They understood. It's beyond our understanding. Yes, yeah, we humans are not super capable of dimensional of understanding that. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, All right. There's one thing I do want people to understand, Dave, though, and that's where to uh, uh, where, where you could write us, Dave. And where's that? That is... Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Oh, 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 you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com, didn't you? Yeah, after all this time, I thought you forgot, so I thought I'd say it again. It's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Or premium at MacGeekGab.com for those of you that are our premium supporters. Very good stuff. Uh, you can call us. Anybody can call us. 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 433 Fine. And you can find us on Facebook. Go to MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook. I have a bunch of stuff there to go through. Uh, I got through, uh, I think I got through all the questions that came in today mm -hmm. while I was gone, but I have not gotten through Facebook. I mean, I, I say I, I mean, you. I, I got through the ones that you had done quite a few, uh, Mr. Braun, and then I, I got home and cleaned up the rest. So um, that's what we have. See us there. I want to, uh, let's see, what do we have? I want to uh, thank Cashfly, C A C H E F L Y dot com, for providing all the bandwidth. I want to thank all our sponsors. Of course, Roboform at roboform.com. Coupon code MGG saves you 10 bucks. Uh, I want to thank Jamf at uh, jmf.com slash MGG. I want to thank Ring. Go check out Ring, ring.com slash MGG. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. What else, John? You know, I, uh, I was in Austin this week. Things were crazy down there um, with some of the stuff going on. And with I, I was able to get out just fine. But everybody else that's in Austin, those of you I know and those of you I don't know, I hope that you don't get caught. I mean that. May not matter.